quiet on the set. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello everybody, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Welcome to the first session of our Albion Seed Study Group. Now we're going to be using David Hackett Fisher's Four British Folkways in America. And before we get too much farther, I'd like you to learn a little bit more about the author. He has been serving um, and employed as a um, history professor at Brandeis University. And he started, uh, he had graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a PhD. And he had served at the point of this publication, and Cousin Russ can share the link with you. Um, he had uh, served for 50 years. So he is a historian and, and a prolific writer. I also have something about his having received the Pulitzer Prize back in May 2005 for his history book titled Washington Crossing. Um, hmm, I love that picture, although I don't know anybody's um, library uh, with books stacked up so neatly and perfectly like that. You might want to know about that. Here's an interview that um, came out in the Nash, I think this is a national, the magazine of the National Endowment for the Humanities um, about regionalism. And David Hackett Fisher, Fisher says, a region for me is a cultural thing. It is people who share a sense of themselves, who form a bond with one another, and also with the place. I like the way you work with that great theme of Eudora Wealthy, places of the heart. I think this is what regions are most of all. Interesting thought. Uh, also, the last thing I wanted to share with you is the Institute for Historical Review. The um, author, Nelson Rosett, um, uh, did a review of Albion Seed. He talked about the, some of the pluses and minuses. He thinks of it or describes it, this book as comprehensive, almost encyclopedic. Um, and it's a guide to colonial American culture. Now I have a question for you. Uh, let's uh, let me let me uh, pull up the four little folkways so we can uh, discuss that, and then I will ask the question. All right. So <clears throat> pull up the slideshow. There we go. There's our book that we're working with. It was published in 1989, and I've been really tickled to see as you all have been receiving yours, uh, you've mentioned it on uh, Facebook. It's really an interesting primer for the British folkways. So we're not talking what happened in um, Spanish colonial time periods in the Americas, etc. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that David Hackett Fisher does is compare and contrast his definition of folkways with what um, Mr. Summers, uh, the author of Folkways, A Study of Mores, Manners, Customs, and Morals, um, he, he compares and contrasts it with the definition provided by Mr. Summers. Now, uh, Mr. Summer was a, a professor of political and social science at Yale University. So you've got one university professor comparing and contrasting with another university professor. And this um, particular book, I, I kind of agree with Jacqueline in a way. She thinks of this as more of an anthropology than a history. And anthropology takes into account, let's look at the surviving evidence, shards of pottery, foundations of homes, surviving homes, um, clothing for, that may have survived from the time period to deduce things about that community's attitudes towards things, their manners, their customs, etc. cetera. Uh, and this particular study group is the first time in a heck of a long time that Ole Mert has done a lecture. Now I do have Cousin Russ here in the wings to help with your comments. I do have my, cousin Dave Robeson who has deep New England roots in addition to his Alabama folks 
and um, and and our the lady archivist, the archive archive lady is here, a favorite archivist. Um, but I want to share with you some of the things that I've discovered. Now, David Hackett Fisher's definition of folkways um, is that it's um, highly persistent but never static, meaning that it's possibly changeable. So he's kind of, I think he's kind of nitpicking, but he says it's folkways are constantly changing in the process of, of creation, even in our own time. Like when I, when I read that, I was thinking of memes, like a meme, M-E-M-E, -E, um, a series of postings that occur online. That could have never been dreamed up in the 1670s, uh, but it is a, a folk way that we have taken into account when we all decide to write on this topic because somebody started with a, with a, a comment or a phrase and everybody else t did their take on it. So in a way I can understand David Hackett Fisher's point of view. All right, let me uh, move this so that I can move the slide a little more readily. So if somehow between what, um, Professor Sumner said and what Professor Hackett said, if we can agree it has to do with manners and customs and things that tend to be known for a certain specific area, then these are the folkways that very specifically in Albion Seed, um, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Hackett discusses. The ones with the stars by it are the ones I'm going to focus on. And I'll occasionally add in a little um, smattering of things. But that gives you an idea of the scope of the compare and contrast that um, uh, Professor Hackett uses when he's discussing the four folkways. Now, to give you just a little bit more about the folkways themselves, one of the migration patterns that he uses and, and spends a lot of time on each one in this book, I mean, criminy, it may have only been an $11 paperback, but including the um, index, it's like uh, 946 pages. <clears throat> Luckily, it's not hardbound, or I'd break my toes uh, walking past it. I don't know. But anyway, you've got the Puritans that came to the Americas in that 1629 through 1641 time period. And uh, the concept behind that was the purification of the church of England and the Roman Catholic Church from within. This is um, different from the pilgrims who were separatists, who believed that those churches could never be reformed. So we're going to be talking about the Puritans. People tend to think of Puritans and pilgrims as the same, but their, their thought process was different. It was religious orientation, but a little bit different reasoning. The second folkway or migration pattern with folkways that we will look at are those who came from the south of England to Virginia and mostly focusing on the distressed cavaliers, the upper class um, folks in Virginia and the indentured servants they kept. And that covered this same early colonial American time period. Uh, and I want to refer you to um, uh, Peter Wilson Coldham's books on the complete book of immigrants and the complete book of immigrants in bondage, which would be those indentured servants. We're not talking slavery. We're talking indentured servants. The third migration pattern that we're going to be discussing is the Friends migration from the North Midlands of England into the Delaware region. So you're going to see Pennsylvania all along the Delaware, et cetera, um, uh, Upper Chesapeake, et cetera. Slightly later time period, but still in the 1600s to begin with. Um, the, the image credit here, I forget to give you this, uh, that sketch is of a 1703 meeting house on Front Street in Philadelphia. 
uh, from the homepage of Swarthmore College. That's where you will find the um, bulk of Quaker records. Um, they have a thing called the FHL. It's the Friends Historical Library. All right. They have over 200 or 2,500 records of microfilm. We're going to be discussing all. Well, not all 2,500 of them. And the fourth migration pattern that uh, Professor Hackett discusses in this book in great detail are a group that came from the borderlands between Scotland and England and in the very northern part of Britain. And they typically went to what we call the back country. These could be Ulster Scots as well. And he even goes so far as to compare and contrast how speech patterns are similar from those folks in the borderlands and the, the descendants of those in the back country who have kept that same dialect in their uh, colloquial phraseology and pronunciation of words. So Cousin Russ, we're dealing with these four groups. And I'm thinking that when we get done, we could actually have a spreadsheet over on Google Docs if we wanted, just dealing with the um, subtopics that I've chosen um, so that in a, it would be like a summary page, wouldn't it? What the different dress preferences were. It's markedly different, the Puritans versus how the women dressed in Virginia, very low cut in Virginia. Um, I like that last row called religion because uh, they are four very different, at least my experience, four different items will be in those four boxes on that line. Mm -hmm. And their form of government's very different. Um, and for instance, today we're going to learn about town meetings as a way to govern. That's something that's uh, very unfamiliar to me. We're looking at county commissioners um, and that covers multiple towns where I live now currently. Dave, do you have, um, do you still have town meeting form of government where you live up in Massachusetts? Want to unmute your mic? There we go. I, I clicked it a few times. Yes, absolutely. Town meetings are, are the various forms of government for, for different towns and for cities. Uh, there are most of the towns and cities have a either a official town meeting or some form of a town meeting uh, by which they govern the, uh, the jurisdictions. So in this case, that type of a folkway has definitely um, gone forth and persisted over centuries in that you still have that form of government. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, let me just, I, I, I have to do this with slides, folks, so forgive me. It's very atypical for old Mert to do this kind of a, a presentation. Um, I have tried to preserve the right to copyright and not infringe on them. We're not charging for this. I'm not advertising for donations or anything. Uh, we are trying to look at the exa examples that he's discussing, and then I've tried to give you some resources that are beyond what we have um, and in his book. So for instance, when we talk about the migration of those um, English Puritans, you're going to want to learn from the um, from HISGEN, New England Historic Genealogical Society, about their great migration directory and information uh, in that second book, the blue one, the great migration be begins because it's covering this same time period. Uh, but it also includes some, uh, it also includes the, the pilgrims who are different from the Puritans. All right. All right, and I have taken the liberty each week to copy very, a very few things that are essential that I could not replicate, even with David Rumsey's maps. 
according to Professor Hackett, um, most of those, this East Anglia part is the, are these shaded areas, these shaded counties in, um, in England. Well, that's where they tended to come from. And if we were to compare and contrast this with the borderlands up here, where the, um, the backcountry people are fourth migration pattern, we would see none from these other areas and see it up here and into the highlands of Scotland. Um, okay, uh, I lost my page. There we are. I have a page of summary notes. So uh, uh, let's go to the next slide and I'll show you this one other thing. Uh, these are the, or this map shows the origins and, the, and there are some exceptions to the East Anglia, aren't there? Immigrants to Massachusetts, but very heavily from East Anglia. And then the immigrants that left England and went to Connecticut and New Haven, also from this East Anglia region, the lower part of it. What I think the thing to tell you is that the basic premise that uh, Professor Hackett has is um, um, he's drawn some conclusions based on his research about what's similar I mean, people come along they don't uh, and and come to the new world they don't just suddenly take up hang gliding my favorite alternative sport and um, start speaking gaelic because they're going to do the same thing that they did back home the houses they build are going to be similar the way they organize their town will be similar the government they select will be similar. Their attitudes towards marriage, their attitudes toward child rearing are going to be very similar. Is it also true that where they settle, the physical environment will be similar? Like, like a coal miner goes to Northeast Pennsylvania, and I think that you have an ancestor, Conrad Weiser, is in a place similar to where he came from. Is that not true? Well, it, it was quite striking for me to notice that um, he did settle in Pennsylvania, which looked very much like his place it, near Gross and Klein Oshbach in Württemberg. Um, in fact, it brought tears to my eyes when I went to the old country. I saw the rolling hills of, of farmland. I saw trees bearing fruit. And at the base of it, a, an orangey red geranium, like it's typical. And I, I recognize Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know that we always have that exact um, parallel. But uh, yes, in that case of my early um, German ancestors, that was true. And these are things that we could find out for ourselves. Now, here's my question. You understand the four migration groups that we're going to be looking at. What if your American immigrants are not in those four migration groups? What could you do? Do you want to quit? be in here? I hope not. But what could you do? Any ideas? Okay. Well, it, it, from my perspective, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got all these, not all the groups, but, but just in learning um, the basis and the foundations of, of where this country began and, and how it's developed since then, I think it anchors everyone's knowledge in um, the history of the, of the country. Um, and how and how it began and how it developed and where were we then and where are we today um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a lot of ways but I suppose it gets well, complicated <laughs> the years. It, do, it does get complicated we're probably going to get some feedback from the community so I'll be ready to give you a spotlight video in a minute Russ um, the thing for me is we I learn from any um, type of study group um, if I take a class or whatever, because I start thinking, 
if somebody's gone to all the effort to do this thinking about these Puritans that came to New England and they sort of are acting like they did back in East Anglia, then I wonder if somebody has done that for my Creole ancestors or for my Hispanic ancestors into California in the colonial time period in colonial Juarez and up into Texas when Mexico went all the way up into Texas and the um, Catholic churches in uh, the old Catholic churches in California I mean we didn't have a territory of California in the colonial time period so maybe there's somebody who's done that kind of research and when it comes to state and county histories there's a book and it's by P. William Philby. And dang, I forgot to get the link on this, even though I knew I was going to do this. Um, P. American County Histories. Let me pull it up. Um, okay. It's thinking about it. Thank you, Google. I probably did. I Yes. Okay. So... Uh, wow, that's interesting. Apparently it's a, at Accessible Archives, but I want to go to, let me just go to Amazon and look for it. Or Google Books. American County Histories. Um, to, a, to a lesser degree, you'll find these in city directories. Oh, great. That's not helping me at all. Let's type in P. William Philby. See if we can get to it that way. Yes, a bibliography of American county histories. They have one left right now um, in paperback, a hardcover, and looks like you can get it. Um, ooh, thirty-seven dollars for a used one. I'm not sure I want to pay for that. There's the book. That's what it looks like. Yes, he wrote this in the 1980s. But what we're talking about our history of counties that have survived from a hundred or 150 years before that. And what do they typically say in county histories? Cousin Russ, you've probably looked at county history of Chester County, Pennsylvania. What kinds of things do they tell you guys in county history books? Well, the one in Chester County is the extension of Pennsylvania because William Penn Went, was in the Chester County, what is now the Chester County area. So, you know, there's a lot of Pennsylvania history in the history of Chester County. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, they'll mention the Germans came in here and the Swedes who had come up the Delaware and, you know, and if they intermarried or they didn't, you'd see things along that line. Um, okay, let me share my screen and show you the book that I finally found. No, um, you, you just took the Oh, I took it away? Off. Okay. Yeah. All right. The other place that I recommend you go to find, now, bibliographies, a list of author, title, and publication, and we know that, um, well, we want to find more bibliographies about the area where an ancestor lived. If he's not one of these four migration patterns, I suggest family search. And we'll pull up family search. I'll sign in. Not a problem. It's free. And um, I will go to the research wiki. And then type in that particular I'll just say Massachusetts, which actually is one of the migration <laughs> patterns. But here is, uh, here's the category of immigration and immigration. E, exit, emigrate. I, coming in, immigrate. Um, that's where you'll find historical information about Massachusetts and um, its neighboring colonies. So, okay. I also think that we train our minds by studying how someone else has, has compared and contrast. After we've gone through this series, we're going to think about 
what was what was the educational climate? What was the attitude toward marriage? Were they a back country where um, you know kidnapping the bride to be was commonplace, and there was a vigilantism um, attitude toward saving your property and family, or was it um, very puritanical where um, they didn't want to have a lot of pomp and circumstance. There wasn't even, a, it wasn't a church ceremony. There were no rings exchanged, et cetera. Um, and those, are, after discussing these things over the next four sessions, we'll be able to look for, we'll have trained our minds to look for scholarly write-ups about these same things in the areas where our ancestors came from. Okay, now if I can find my poor PowerPoint, I will go forward here to the next slide. All right, <clears throat> one of the first things that um, struck me, I mean, I, I was reading Albion Seed, this was years ago in the late 80s, and somebody said, oh, Albion Seed is just the best, you've got to find out about this, it explains about um, New England and about Virginia, which were the ones I was most interested in. And I kind of got lost because he goes on and on. When he did a compare and contrast of the salt box style of home here with what was back in Kent, all that was different here is that the chimney was slightly off. That's when it started to make sense to me. Again, I'm relating to the graphical interface. I could um, use this example from the Comfort Star House in Guilford, Connecticut. I found that on Historic American Buildings of Connecticut. I couldn't find one over in uh, Dareth, Kent because all the real estate ads started popping up and I wasn't going to pay $2 million for a home. Okay, and also um, the fact that these are, well, you can have a salt box house um, built in brick, but they're typically what I call clapboard. What do you call that, Dave? That, that horizontal white um, wood. You nailed it. It's clapboard. It's clapboard. Clapboard. Mm -hmm. All well, right. wood frame and the whole thing's wood other than the foundation and the, and the chimney. Yeah. So um, none of this modernistic, let's pour the cement wall and tilt it up and connect it no. to the next wall. <laughs> no. uh, all right. Now I want to um, show you something, if I can find the right page. Wikipedia had a lot to say about salt boxes. And all of their examples happen to be New England. But one of the things they said. Wonder why that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not enough people from England have been contributing. Uh, so somebody said here that there's a bit of folklore, and it was in this article. Let me give you all that link, Cousin Russ, um, if you want to share this with everyone. Um, said that um, the there was uh, folklore that holds that the salt box was popularized by Queen Anne's ta uh, taxation of houses more than one story tall. All right, so if we were to look at this, and the if this is the back of your house and that's the front of your house, like we think of it, this is the front. But if it's flipped around and all somebody saw was a high-pitched roof and the rest was the backside of your house, Maybe that's, you know, that's just the a traditional reason for why they did that. Um, yeah, okay. And thanks to uh, Professor Fisher for this from page 65. All right, next thing. I can get to PowerPoint. All right, now I had to draw a picture of a New England town. That's my sketch. You can see why I probably had to drop out of art classes in college. <laughs> now, think of a typical New England town. If it just has one church, it's definitely on the square. In Connecticut, there could be, you had to belong to one of the churches on the square, this was a little bit later, in order to vote. Uh, the black boxes with the uh, 
diagonal lines represent homes and the red lines um, represent property lines. And in the town square, you would have the pillory and uh, the, the place for people to gather. And when you compare that to what typically, I mean, this concept of, okay, the homes are in town, the church is on the square, and the farmlands that support this are in the distance. Um, that's very similar to what was happening over in Essex, England. Uh, they had market stalls um, illustrated. Some of this were called backsides. And there was a time period um, with the, not the Puritans, but the pilgrims, where there were no fences here on the backside beyond like a kitchen garden. So the, the small cattle, the sheep, et cetera, could run free back beyond behind the homes. But I didn't put that in my illustration. If, if I could interject here very briefly, yes. the one thing not represented here, which was very, very important, were the training grounds, which were usually usually close to the town square, but yes. there had to be a place where the uh, local militia could train and learn how to fire a weapon and uh, to defend the town against uh, Absolutely. attack. Absolutely. And training day was one of the four generally accepted holidays among the Puritans in this colonial time period. As I recall, there was Thanksgiving. Um, the training days could be any time in the spring or summer, but that was so the militia could do their thing. Um, there was commencement day, which I'm not exactly sure what that is. It's in July, but it was like a summer festival. And election day. And that was so people would be free to elect their town councilman. And they, and they, that meant the people were definitely going to be in town, not out hunting or something along that line. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, there could be, it could be used in this area. There wouldn't be enough room for them to do much in the town square. Um, they would need to have space. Thank you. Uh, I know that when I have visited New England, mm -hmm. uh, all over New England, those formats are there today. So they haven't gone anyplace. I, uh, <laughs> I remember driving through the various towns uh, in New England and you would see that same format. Mm -hmm. But yes. you don't see that in as much in other parts, where, which is where this book is Heading really us. Because you won't see that in the other immigration points. Yeah. How uh, have any of you been to like Mount Vernon or where you, it's a long way between the edge of the property and the grand home. So they don't go uh, along with this pattern of uh, let's have the town, let's have the home in town and all the property is elsewhere. I think Dave will back me up in that yeah. you go down south and you will see th what you just described. You will see the, the thoroughfare, wh whatever it is that you're riding on, but you won't see the house because it's back behind a lane, usually surrounded by trees on either side of that lane. So you, mm -hmm. you can't see the place from uh, the the thoroughfare. Right, from the main road. W one other thing I'd point out in, 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 your, uh, in the drawing here is that by having all the living, uh, the, the housing lots close to the center of town, when there was uh, uh, a war conflict stirring, it was very easy for them to build a fence com around the entire community mm -hmm. uh, for defense. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I would contrast that with a plantation in uh, Manti County, Florida, where the defense, um, oh, let's see, the property was built on the river so that the um, product could get down to market. And way back was the plantation home. And the only defense um, on this property was the second floor of the kitchen which you could only get to by a ladder. And then once you're up inside, you brought the ladder up and it was basically 
they would have to starve you out, I guess. So, yeah, so you are bringing your own experiences with the things that you've seen from earlier time periods and comparing and contrasting this already. So you're good thinking, guys, good thinking. Um, okay, so um, let us, um, let's go forward with this discussion here. All right, now I want us, us to go online and actually look at some clothing styles. Uh, we always think of Puritans and even pilgrims as wearing very dark drab clothing. And so we're gonna actually go online. Let me pull that back up again. And, and just doing a Google search for Puritan dress, what they wanted to do was a shoe, a shoe no longer support. <laughs> the behavior of Charles I with his um, big puffy sleeves and all the ornamentation and everything else. Uh, and so we see things like this. Oh, well, there's our pillory, I guess. Uh, somebody must have missed church on Sunday, they say. Um, yeah, here again is that popular f uh, fashion in Western Europe all kinds of um, finery and ribbons and, and lace and tapestry prints and things like that. But Puritan clothing itself was known for being typically very um, conservative and drab. Actually, russet was their, one of their most popular colors, although dark green, et cetera, would be popular. And um, the, the felt hat, kind of doesn't come up to an exact point, but kind of cone-shaped. Um, and uh, that, I, I think any one of these examples uh, brings that to mind. Uh, I think I also have one other thing to bring to your attention. This page about Puritan life, let me give you that, Cousin Russ, and I'll give you the link to these others as well. This is clothing. And um, uh, we will talk about um, some of their sporting things and what was thought to be appropriate. Um, their, the black clothing was especially important for the clergy and the leaders. Um, so consider a bit of that. Uh, there's more for you to go discovering there in addition to what we're dealing with. Do we have any comments from the community that we need to bring in or can I go to this next slot? You can go ahead. I'll just bring them all in a little bit later. There are a bunch, so. Okay. All right. So if we were to, let me leave, um, leave this for a minute. If we were to spend some time talking, I'll give you my bottom line uh, thoughts. Uh, summarizing what uh, Professor Fisher is talking about. And I will stop my screen share for a little bit. Um, man, there's so many things. One thing I thought that was interesting concerning education, they believe that every child should be educated by their parents or their master. Two-thirds of them were said to have been able to read and write, which seems to me to be a high level of uh, literacy. Um, yeah. Well, let, let me say that that was important because reading the Bible was part of the culture, and you needed to know how to read and so that you could read Scripture 24-7. And that uh, view of, um, of framing your life around hard work, never an idle moment, um, being able to read the scriptures. Being able to read the scriptures was important because the Puritans recognized that in the uh, old country, the clergymen wanted to keep the typical church attendee ignorant of what was in the Bible. You know, this has even come down through my, you know, I have, uh, the Mormon church has descend, has ancestors from that Vermont, Massachusetts area, um, upstate New York. 
etc. And that thought that we must be educated so that we can read and study it out in our own minds um, it, it has persisted even though I don't have ancestors from that area, I do have Mormon pioneer ancestors. That has persisted hundreds of years. Well, that, and, and that, that's why Latin stayed uh, uh, popular for so long. The upper classes and the uh, universities and the, and the clerics and so forth, they read and spoke Latin so that, and, and everything was printed in Latin so that the, the middle and lower classes couldn't, uh, could be led by them and not understand all the principles that the, uh, were extant at the time. Yeah. I, 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 I know in the church history that I have studied, the same thing is, is that the church, uh, the, the leaders of the church, the, the clergy people were in total control and they controlled it. And we'll see later, I'm guessing, is that one of those other migration paths will be very different. In the mm -hmm. church and the government, uh, if you look at the architecture of the government and the church, they'll be very similar, but very different on those four paths. Yes. Uh, yes, Dave? I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but the, the, um, the Calvinists in particular, they, were, they believed that only a certain number of people had already been predestined to be saved. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it and I could go on and on about that, but but that's part of what we're talking about here. Why they left so many people, tried to leave so many people in the dark. But um, anyway, it, 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 things changed over the years. Is is there any we? There's a hint, a word that's been going through my mind through this whole discussion. We're 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 talking about the pull factor, what happened when we got there, but. I think there's hints of the push factor, and we we talk about push and pull factors. Mm -hmm. They were trying to, when you had the picture of Charles's fluffy shoulders. Mm -hmm. That that's to me said there's a hint in there of why the people left where they were. Yes, um, Professor uh, Fisher says it, there it wasn't so much a pull factor as a push factor to motivate these folks to leave the East Anglia area and uh, come to the new world. It was religious freedom for that point of view of let's be educated about it. Um, and, uh, but as much power as the church had, uh, the Church of England had over these folks over in England, um, uh, they were very tight in the control of your every move here in New England once these East Anglians came to Massachusetts. And don't forget, they went to Holland first. They spent probably a generation in Leiden before they came back to England and came over here. Okay, so let's talk about, let's see, let me read some of my notes. Sad colors is what they referred to them as and very conservative. Um, um, they believed in breaking the will of children. So that would never work here in the United States. You'd, th you'd have child protective services on your case right now. Sparing the rod and spoiling the child is a concept. Um, you mentioned that only certain people were elected to, um, to be saved by God, the old thought in the old country. They did have this concept of something called an elder saint. And I, I had never heard that phrase before until a Professor Fisher brought it up. That's an, a person that, it, that is highly spiritual and they were considered to have a peculiar acquaintance with Jesus Christ. Um, no idle time. And if you were idle, you got punished for it. Um, and you got shamed for it and you got called out for it. Um, typically, the uh, average person got 60 acres of land. Some people got quite a bit more depending on their station. There was a little bit of class distinction 
we could construe it to be that just from the fact that it didn't all get 60 acres, some got more. Um, we know about the town meetings and the selectmen. That public school that I talked about, well, the, the parents could either educate the child on their own or in a public school, it was compulsory. And parents who neglected that duty were also called out and severely reprimanded for that. Uh, what about your typical gambling and horse racing, Dave? Does, was that a possibility? <laughs> Well, on, on what you were just talking about, uh, one thing that happened typically in, in towns in the 17th and early 18th century, you could be warned out of town, meaning if you didn't conform and you didn't go to church uh, or belong to a congregation, um, which a congregationalist church, somebody asked in the chat, isn't the, isn't the, the pur uh, Puritanism was the uh, foundation for the Congregationalist Church, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, but you could, if you weren't an upright citizen, you could be warned out of, warned out of town, and you had to pack up and, and get out unless you, you know, straightened out your ways and, mm -hmm. and followed and, and conformed. You had to belong to a church. Otherwise, you, if you were a farmer, you couldn't sell your goods. If you were whatever, as a smith, you couldn't, uh, no one would come to you to do any, for any you business. You so, in that regard. You, absolutely. Although, and, and the pillory, you mentioned that earlier, in case anybody missed that, oh, you can end up in the stocks, you know, get, yes. get pill, but get pilloried. I mean, you're in, you're in the, um, you're in the town square and that's hugely embarrassing to, to anyone, to, not only to the person, but to their entire family. And it's very uncomfortable punishment. Very uncomfortable, yeah. So it's a form of physical punishment. Um, I also thought it was interesting that um, they did believe that recreation was important, although they didn't like gambling and games of chance and horse racing and things like that. Football was an interesting sport. So was a game called the New England game, which basically had a bat and four bases. What does that sound like, guys? baseball <laughs> um, and that it was necessary for you to be a healthy person to exercise like that but not on Sunday and uh, sexual relations between husband and wife was uh, forbidden on Sunday um, typically no divorce particularly in the first uh, in that first generation and their children and grandchildren they had few if any servants and especially compared to what we think of of the um, those cavaliers in Virginia that were used to living a high life back in England but couldn't inherit land uh, because the older son got it all so they came to England I mean came to Virginia and wanted to emulate that same type of life uh, so they uh, they had servants um you, excuse me you mentioned divorce mm -hmm. my eighth great grand aunt got one of the first divorces in um in the colony because her husband was caught with another woman and it's almost hysterical to read the court documents about uh about that case and he ended up he and his quote-unquote girlfriend ended up in rhode island um shortly thereafter yeah it was um if people married and um, let's see if I can cancel spots. There had to be a real good solid reason why a woman was granted a divorce or a man was granted a divorce. Yeah, they were it, I heard that they were very harsh on men and not quite as harsh on the woman. But I don't I would like to study that more uh, to make a definitive statement. Uh, let's see. I mentioned the festivals. There was that witchcraft thing. Uh, they believed that uh, we were good, but we could be influenced by evil. We needed to get evil out of our lives and push it out of our lives. That was a very, that was actual physical thing. Um, how many of you have heard of bundling boards? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what that, that is, Dave. <laughs> well, picture this. You have a large family, a husband and wife and four, five, six, seven, eight kids, and you live in one room. So where does everybody sleep um, uh, when, when a, a, a man and a woman had to sleep in the same bed and they weren't necessarily married, there was a board that separated the two so that there wouldn't be any hanky-panky. And those were called 
bundling boards. Yeah, they. It was a form of courtship. Yeah, um, which exactly. I found hysterical, but that you know that's just me reacting to it. The wife could be, or the 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 the, the girl could was put in a bundling bag that was cinched tight at her waist, and her ankles could have been tied with cloth as well and they could be affectionate with each other over this board but not uh not in anything below the waist basically and um there was an example you know one of the, aside from these generalizations uh professor hackett gives you a lot of uh specific examples of what has survived and he gives a footnote about um, the source of that information. One of them was a girl who said she did not want to marry this certain man uh, because he was not affectionate. And though her husband or her father rather wanted her to marry this man because he would support her well, he acquiesced to her wishes and it was that was the normal courtship procedure to go through to sleep together see if the person snores i don't know i can't imagine it <laughs> but you know there's an unusually high you'd be very surprised to know of the unusually high rate of premarital premarital uh, relations and women who became pregnant before the benefit of being married. So they would end up in, in front of the magistrate and they would be fined, but the fine would be, uh, um, uh, they would be forgiven if they proceeded and, and got into a marriage, which is where my spiritualist eight, uh, great grand aunt got the, uh, the phrase, the first one comes anytime, the rest take nine months. Uh -huh, I hear you. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> but there was, a, there was much, much more than that than you would think. You would think Puritans, oh my God, they, they did everything by the book. No. Yeah, I agree no. that it is. No, there's a... Peggy Lawrence is making a comment. The rates of fornication and trials is high in Massachusetts. Yep. And probably still it. is. <laughs> um, I thought it was interesting that he felt that men typically got married when they were about 26 and women were 23. Um, um, the attitude toward marital sex was that that was a necessary part for a happy marriage as opposed to a uh, thought by other religions uh, that it should only be for um, procreation. So I thought that was an interesting attitude. I didn't think they'd be that open. I, and if you don't mind, I want to go back to a comment you had made earlier. I hate to keep interrupting you, but that's well, okay. The, the Calvinist theory was that men were basically evil. Humans were basically evil. Well, uh, uh, you know, what's the, wrong the, with the, that thought? I agree. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the concept of depravity, whereby they thought everybody was cursed by Adam, uh, who, uh, you know, who obviously started off. And then there was a covenant. They talked about a covenant. Yes. Which was an agreement with God that, but God would only save the elected. And who were the elected? Nobody knew, apparently. Um, so everybody had to work hard at being good and, and trying to be uh, as a, a covenant as a family a covenant family is something that uh, prof the professor discusses and, and our founder here in Springfield wrote a book called the meritorious price of our redemption where he wrote and and contradicted all these Calvinist principles and that book that he wrote was the first book that was banned and burned in Boston if you've oh. ever heard that phrase oh. Oh, yes. And he got tossed out of the colony. Oh. Sent back to so, a wealthy guy, though. Anybody know what peas, porridge, hot, peas, porridge, cold, peas, porridge, in the pot, nine days yep. old is all about? What well, it, mm -hmm. it really has to do with peas, not oatmeal. Correct. And uh, that was one of their basic food ways. Yeah, it was Ugh. a definitive leftover. <laughs> 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 it just stayed in the, in the iron pot pot inside the fireplace mm -hmm. and for however until it was gone yeah until it was gone so this kind of cooking in a fireplace um as opposed to an open fire um was you know that that was pretty common through all of these folk ways that we're talking about but the food was that was one staple another one was boiling the heck out of the meat and the potatoes um, uh, he talks about um, their common beverage in Massachusetts in the 17th century was dark English beer. 
I don't think they imported it. <laughs> I think no. they made it. Uh, and that they had fruits and vegetables in the season. And obviously we're talking about, you know, established, uh, you know, um, fruit trees and, that are now finally bearing fruit. I thought it was interesting that even though we're talking New England and I think of lobster and all of that, he felt that shellfish was regarded with grave suspicion. Um, but most fish and waterfowl were um, uh, considered delicacy. So Lobster wasn't even considered a delicacy till the early 20th century. They used it for bait is junk food for the most junk part. food uh yeah. i'll take that junk food any time yeah yeah 19 dollars a pound sure <laughs> oh okay have Are we there's... got any comments you wanted to bring in russ there's too many oh, but okay. I, my my comment is that the one thing that i like about new england today and i did this two a couple of years ago is that i was able to take my granddaughters who currently who live in utah mm -hmm. to get them to experience what we've been talking about and that is at uh, plymouth plantation mm -hmm. so they get to experience uh this discussion we've been having uh, yeah. the people the reenactors in the village speak as they may have at the time mm -hmm. uh they walk around they dust the floor, dirt floor with a broom that they made. They build their own houses. Mm -hmm. but, but I wanted the grandkids to experience that, what we've been talking about, because their ancestors are from New England. So that's the, uh, that was a better example than reading it in the book, but they had to the experience. And then I, to, to contrast that, I brought him into New Jersey to a house that was a hundred years newer than mm -hmm. the Plymouth Plantation. And then they started to see the difference of, especially in the kitchen, in the house where we visited, mm -hmm. <coughs> that they could hear the same stories, but see what has changed over a period of a hundred years, mm -hmm. then they can go home and see what has happened, uh, you know, today. So yeah, we tend to put all the old, old things, New England. Yeah. Now and, this, yeah. this summer or when we have another burial at Arlington National Cemetery, and when that happens, I think that the grandkids are going to come back and we're going to hopefully take them to Williamsburg to then see the southern what the southern culture was and mm -hmm. I, I will have an opportunity to that to get them to think about the compare and contrast what did you see on cape cod as opposed to what do you see at williamsburg mm -hmm. yeah, the so Pl plymouth plantation is amazing if you, anybody gets a chance to go there it is as an exact replica of the original plantation as they could possibly come up with and they did it through archaeological digs and and court records of who got what land and how many acres etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. and it's uh, and he russ is 100 percent correct those people are 100 percent in character and the neat thing for me is when i go there i could ask them where my grandparents live where did mr bassett live oh mr ba and he, they talk he's right they talk in an odd <laughs> sort of a odd way, but they told me where my grandfather William Bassett lived and where a couple of my other relatives had lived. It was just, it just brought the hair up on the back of my neck to walk into these buildings that were representative and for all mm -hmm. practical purposes were the actual houses that they lived in almost 400 years ago. Almost 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Compare and, and contrast that with what you see when you walk out the south end or the downside end of that village and you go into uh the native american village oh, that yeah. is there yeah. now it looks like what we would read in the book of what uh an indian village would look like but there's a major difference they speak in current language mm -hmm. so that the kids can understand what they're saying right they're not doing narragansett or whatever their right. language was yeah so the the, the interpretation in that village is to tell the story so that the kids and 
adults mm -hmm. can understand what the stories are about. So it was more about the story, but experience what the place looked and felt like at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting. Just walking through that gate between the two villages, you had a very different, at least I had a very different experience. Well, it's, um, it's a phenomenal thing and it's our privilege to use our money uh, that we have as grandparents to help impart this because basically their parents are doing all they can to keep shoes on the kids and food on the table. Um, all right, a couple more things before we wrap this baby up, okay? Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention, and I, I alluded to it previously, that primogenitor, which is that system where the oldest son inherits everything back in England, is problematic as the land gets divided up into smaller and smaller um, portions. There's reasons why that happens. But the second son, pretty much, he's got to go into the clergy or the military. So a push could be for land. Now, back in England, you had the crown and the peerage and all those upper, upper class, upper, greater, uh, more prestigious, gentrified folks. And you had the, the, the poor who would be the leaseholders or maybe landless laborers. These are things that um, um, Professor Hackett goes into great detail about in this chapter. Uh, and then you even had the vagrant poor who didn't have uh, a, a, someone they could labor for in the fields, didn't have any leases. And in the middle were tradesmen, watchmakers, candle makers, silversmiths, um, uh, people along that line. Now, once you came to, uh, um, to Massachusetts. You did have the warning outs that Dave was talking about. Um, they did have poor laws and they were very careful as they were in England to find out if the woman's having a baby and that she's not married, who the heck is the father? You've heard tales of how they would, the women, the midwives, would prevail upon the woman in the heat of labor. Who the heck was the guy? And by then she's willing to give up the, <laughs> you know, say who it was, uh, at quite specifically because he needed to assume the responsibility rather than the community assuming the responsibility for that upbringing of that child. I think uh, it's interesting on that specific topic how some of the traditions from where they came from were brought forward yes. to where they uh, landed. And those traditions that they, the reason why they left, they left it there, that they mm -hmm. did not bring it in. And I think each of these migrations will be different. What did they bring? What did they leave? And poor, mm -hmm. I didn't know poor laws because I hadn't done research in New England. Mm -hmm. Poor laws is ver the poor, the Poor laws were very predominant in New England, right, Dave? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, there, and there was a responsibility to, to take care of them. And I haven't seen those laws. They may be. I just haven't found them in the other parts of the country that I have researched. So they and, brought that one forward. And then one they didn't bring forward was that the oldest son could inherit. They did away with that. Um, so it was a matter of the oldest son might get a double portion, but it, then the rest was equally divided among the children. So that then was. Then you got to figure about departure. what happened. You had to figure out what happened to the the women. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, the study of women's rights uh, is quite different, and particularly with our Quaker ancestors, Russ. We had a lot more rights as women there. Uh, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Anyway, basically, I want to direct your attention to this book. Um, there's a few left at Amazon. They just restocked some of them. Um, this you, I could pour over this chapter again and again. 
I think that the Quaker chapter starts on page 207. So there's a book right there and just the part um, explaining folkways generally, if you first couple of pages, and then zooming in on this migration pattern from East Anglia to Massachusetts. The first time I read it, I related to the pictures. The second time I read it, which was in about uh, just before I, I actually did this whole book in an hour with my uh, Minnesota Genealogical Society, and we divided up the room into four quarters or quadrants. And uh, since it wasn't being recorded and we were a nonprofit educational organization, I used the examples from the book and they actually created a poster for each one of these four um, migration patterns. Um, now, when we start with our um, um, second group, um, we will then be able to start comparing and contrasting more with this first group that we've discussed. All right, Cousin Russ, before we go, we just have, we've got, gosh, it was almost on time. Um, I want to mention this. Can you see plus words, guys? No, not yet. Uh, it would be nice if I shared my screen. I just want to tell you that Cousin Russ and I are going to be partners in a game of plus word on Friday night with our host, Michael Daniels. And Cousin Russ can give you that link. It's in Trello. Um, and then the, the second thing to do is to just tell you, get this book. Start training your mind to think this way. Um, and when we meet again, we will start with the second group. And that is uh, coming up in a week, isn't it, Cousin Russ? Yep. Then, we, then we have to take a couple of weeks off. Uh, I, just to make a comment here, and I believe this is to be true, mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of comments that we did not have time to bring in. When this is posted, this uh, chat will be with your in your blog post, correct? That's what you've done in the past. Yes, I've been I've been um, archiving it in my blog. Right. Uh, and that, but our can we can continue our conversation about it. Yeah, I uh, was just going to post that, but I just want to point out that the the chat log, the comments that you all made, and thank yes. you for them, will be in the chat log that's recorded when this is posted. It was just a, a lot of conversation going on, a lot of great conversation going well, on. I should let you know, though, Russ, when we meet for an hour about, uh, even though I've told it to give me the whole entire chat, it doesn't. So some of it will be cut off. And it's not because I don't care. It's just the way it is. Um, is there any way I can copy and paste the whole darn thing? I'm, I'm checking to see because I already, I just cut, saved it. I'll see, I'll know whether it's, all there or not. All right, this is where we can continue the conversation. Let me, uh, am I screen sharing still, Russ? Can you see it? No, nope. I, right. I put the link in the chat. All right, um, here's the spotlight video. We'll do a screen share so that you can, um, ah, ah, there it is. Okay, so um, that's pretty good. Can you now see it, Cousin Russ? I see the book. All right. The, the conversation, the log that I just saved started at 42, which was before we started. Okay, good. So um, you may have to give me a copy of that because what I have as the host uh, doesn't, it, I mean, it's always cut off and I've been really sad trying to reconstruct it. Okay, so this is the discussion group at Dear Myrtle's Genealogy Community. It's right there at the top. Um, and we find this is easier for um, conversations to continue than using Facebook, where you see about, unless you know to go to a group, you're seeing between one and 6% of a post, of the posts that are made in a specific group. So we want to increase your chances. Anyway, okay, I guess that's about it. Let's wrap this baby up, okay? 
All right. On behalf of Cousin Russ, I'd uh, like to thank Dave for contributing so much to this. Melissa, you've been our touchstone cheerleader uh, throughout all this. We appreciate it. And thank you all for your comments and your support. Uh, and have fun reading this book. It's really fascinating. Uh, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Happy family tree climbing, everybody. That's a wrap. <laughs>